Well, that was very powerful indeed. That was amazing. And Alexis just joined us, I think, and on the call. No. Oh, the brilliant. Boxes, I can't That's good. quite see. Good. good. Well, we'll be able to talk about that more. It, we'll get on with um, the next presentation now. And then what I was thinking was that at the end, um, Kieran and I and Alexis will be um, here to have any discussions that you want as well, if that's okay. Yeah. All right, so I, of course, I'm not autistic. I don't have a learning disability. Um, so this is coming from someone who is a professional, was a professional, um, and try very hard um, to, to, to not to use language. And, and this is a bit about the reasons why um, when Simon's able to put the slides up. Um, but for anybody that does know me on the call, they'll know that this is something that I'm quite uh, passionate about. And we'll talk oh. about it any opportunity, Kieran, won't I? <laughs> so, so that was why I wanted to do this today. So we're, we're going to be talking today, as you're aware, about um, language. Uh, I do something called life planning as well. And uh, it's one of the ways I can make sure that I'm producing documents for people at the end of it that um, are as, uh, as positive as possible for people. So, that, so that's how I test myself every time um, I start doing that work. Can we have the next slide? So today, we've probably not got enough time for a break, but we're, I'm gonna talk a bit about something called service land. And again, people that know me um, will have heard about this before, but I'm just going to explain a bit about service land. Um, and then I'm going to talk a bit about, uh, and Kieran as well will help me, about why, why we think perhaps professionals use the service land language, um, which is all the stuff that Alexis was talking about early, all those horrible reports and things that are written about people. Um, so we're going to have a, a, a little look about that and uh, your opinions on that as well. And I'm going to talk a bit about the damage that language can do. So again, it's been reflected in what Alexis has already said, um, but, but just how, how much you can influence somebody's life for the positive or the negative by the ways you write or speak about people. And then we're going to have a think about um, what people that have been listening, what you guys want to do next, what you want to take away from this. Um, and so that's what we're going to be doing. Simon, the next one. I don't think. Yeah, and the next one after that, though. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. I just talked about them all. So we're going to talk a little bit about service land now. And I know this is even a made up word itself, but I feel OK with using it because it's a made up world for a made up place. Um, so it isn't uh, talking about something that's real, to be quite honest. This is talking about a, a quasi, quasi life, quasi world, really, that we as professionals have made for people with learning disabilities and people with mental health needs and autistic people. Um, so basically people that are discriminated against. Um, and it's basically somewhere that we wouldn't want to live ourselves. So it's, um, it, it's making housing solutions and support solutions that if we were offered um, the same, I don't think we, we would agree to, to accept them. So it's a very odd, odd place. Um, and it's, again, as Alexis was saying earlier, it's, it's a place that perpetuates othering. So it's somewhere where we can talk about them and him and all those things that, that we again we wouldn't want to talk about ourselves um, about. It restricts restrict choices. So um, a home to somebody with a disability in service land isn't often a home that we would uh, choose for ourselves or want to live in. I think for some people who are born with a disability, um, it's, some, it's somewhere that pretty much stays with them from when they're born until they die, unless um, they're lucky enough to get themselves out of it. It's not usually with the help of other people. Um, and it has its own language and culture and expectations. Um, and that's so people in service land become service users. Um, and it's okay for them to live with strangers. Uh, and the expectations we have 
for people in service land are not as high as those that we would have for ourselves. Um, uh, and we wouldn't want to live there ourselves, um, but the people that are within service land don't have much choice at all. Kieran, do you want to add anything to that? Um, yeah, basically the language of service land, I think is, is designed to exclude anybody not in that, that mm. particular branch of service land. Um, mm. There's even different languages within service land. There's health, there's health speak and there's social services speak. Um, an example of that was, I mean, we all know how highly, highly educated doctors are. You know, just it, it, you have to do a university course just to, to become a very, very junior doctor. Mm -hmm. uh, and to become a GP, you have to do even more university level courses. Um, so I'm not going to kind of argue with anyone about, about how intelligent doctors are. But I was at a meeting, oh, this is a couple of years ago now, um, and making it real to us. Are you, are you, are you um, familiar with the making it real process? No. Uh, Jenny and I were sitting at a table with a mixture of, of professionals, some some so, some social services, some um, GPs, couple of uh, commissioners, mm -hmm. and the document, as as it had been written at that stage. stage was so so social services driven yeah. that even the well educated doctors couldn't understand it. <laughs> so it's um, like a secret language, a secret social service land language that the doctors um, couldn't even understand. And the and the and the, the 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 and the problem with having these secret languages that no one else can understand is they can mean whatever mm. the person that's, that's using it wanted to. I mean. Yeah. Um, I mean, I mean, okay. Law, law has a language of its own as well. That's very true. But I have to like the language of law. I understand this. Yeah. I can go to the I can go to the official documents and go, okay, that says such and such. That says such and such. So, mm. okay, that's what I'm allowed to do. That's what I'm not allowed to do. Mm. Um, right, Karen, should we we'll carry on with this one a bit later? Yeah, move on yeah. a little bit. All right then. So, what this what this presentation isn't about is saying that everybody's wrong and getting you all anxious and worried about what on earth you're going to say and not wanting to open your mouth. Because what what I'd also like to say to people is that we're all in. We're, we're all in this together, okay? And we are, we're in service land because that's where we all work. Um, and it's something that we've, uh, you know, developed in ourselves over time. So this is, this is giving opportunities for us to reflect on things. And I'm no angel and I still use language and words that I would not like to, um, you know, sometimes get it wrong, but it's just, you know, it's one of those things. Um, but and, and I think sometimes we we don't um, subconsciously use words, so we don't always mean to to say the things that we're doing. And sometimes people <clears throat> use words um, because they've picked them up and they think that's what they should be doing. So there's all sorts of reasons why, which again we'll talk about a bit more in a minute. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, this is about trying to change those things. Um, and I think the one lesson for everybody is that we all have the power within ourselves to change ourselves. So whatever else is going on out there, as Kieran was just describing about um, that kind of meeting, that doesn't mean we have to buy into it. Um, and I think what I like about um, being able to challenge language is that it's something I can do myself. There's barriers to a lot of things 
within the work that we do that we can't change on our on our own you know there's massive things that that need total culture change for things but the culture of the language that you um talk and what you write is up to you to be able to change um so i guess that that's something that that i get out of this that i can actually do something every day to change and, and hopefully help the people that i'm working with so um has anybody got any examples of, of service land words and things that they've heard if you want to write things in the chat that would be good what we got on there people are start, okay people are starting to write things can we go on to the next slide um hopefully well, I to have, <laughs> <laughs> i'm definitely pressing things now sam like because i can't seem to quite get the That's controls right. to work i may have to uh, somehow see if i Hmm. Sorry, everybody. That's all right. We'll carry on. People, yeah. if, if, if people can just say about um, why why do you think that professionals use words? Then what what are the reasons that that you think um, professionals have to use this kind of language? Do people know? So you know, because we don't have to do it, but we all do, don't we? Yeah, power. That's a very very good word there. Definitely. Yeah, exactly. To make you feel a bit more knowledgeable about stuff, especially if you're new. Mm -hmm. I remember being a first time being a social worker and being so scared and not even wanting to put my hand up to ask what people meant by uh, certain things they were saying. So I'd write it down and then go and scurry off and try and ask somebody afterwards. Um, because it, because you feel like you're not going to be in with people or people are going to think you're silly if you don't know what they're talking about. Right, if you go on to the next one after that, Simon, that would be good. This so one. these are some of the reasons, yeah, these are some of the reasons that, that I kind of thought about why people use certain language, um, you know, as people were saying, because it's used by others, so you're trying to fit in, um, makes us feel important. And again, you know, it's not just professional highly paid for professionals we all use this language and there is some research that says that people that are you know that support workers who maybe aren't um you know aren't valued really and we know even with this academic ac the um coronavirus that we've had that people haven't been valued that actually using language that puts you above the people you're supporting is something that that makes people feel better about themselves as well um, and because we're lazy, so some of these things, it always makes me laugh when people use acronyms or whatever it is where you see like ASD and people don't even know what they blooming mean. So it's kind of lazy way of not saying somebody's autistic or whatever. Um, and then uh, there's the more worrying things, which is that actually it de dehumanizes people and people use language because they don't see people as they see themselves and that's where um, it can lead to quite not nice stuff going on really um, but and again you know another thing within service land service land is is there because it's we restrict what we give to people so we restrict their access to housing and um, and services and again, using language that can um, kind of dehumanize people and um, make them not so worthy, makes it a bit easier for us to sometimes tell people they can't have things or restrict people's services as well. Um, so there's lots of things. Some of it's not nice. Some of it we don't realize we're doing, but all of it hurts people. Uh, and actually none of it, we don't have to do any of it. Um, can we go on to the next one? So the, this always makes me laugh. This, um, I think it probably came up on Facebook. Most things do, don't they? But there are so many times where I have uh, had a referral for, you know, to start working with somebody 
And when you read it, you think you wonder how you're ever going to get in the room with the person because they're so dangerous and they're there's so so many things about them um, that 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 makes it, it feel hard and that and when you actually get to meet that person, they are nothing like what's described. Um, and you just wonder what damage has been done by this misinformation about somebody going around everywhere. I mean, again, Alexis was brilliant with her, um, you know, her examples from her life about how uh, what's written down can, can affect people. Um, but, you know, I mean, most of the time now I don't bother reading stuff until after I've met the person because it's just not worth it. And then you can make up your own mind about people. Um, but I'm sure all of you have met somebody in your life more than once, probably, where you think, where did that all come from? Because that isn't the people, the person that I've just met. Can I have the next one, Simon? So this, this is on this slide is the, uh, Kieran's here partly because he was one of my inspirations when I started um, a campaign that, that I've been running for a while because I, which is called I Am Challenging Behaviour. I went and did some work with Kieran and some others up north, up north from here. And Kieran came up with this amazing quote, um, to, which just summarises everything so well, I think, in a very cheeky way um, about how, um, you know, how it, it seems to those people that, that are having this language used on them as such. Um, but, you know, it doesn't make us, any of us look good or clever, to be quite honest, Kieran, does it? Using language like yeah. that. <laughs> fact uh, it makes you kind of want to laugh at people really um so yeah um, and 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 in all honesty sam yeah sometimes sometimes that is about the most productive thing you can do when it's not actually happening to you obviously yeah obviously when when it is happening to you mm. it's rather difficult to just laugh yeah, at something don't you? But, Absolutely, exactly that. And that's what we're going to talk a bit about now, Kieran, is actually what, how it can affect people's lives extremely mm. badly. So um, can you go on to the next one, Simon? So language can most definitely um, damage people. Absolutely. Uh, and again, Alexis example of her life is exactly how um, that can affect affect somebody. I'm going to describe it a little bit by talking about um, somebody who um, has influenced me quite a lot and that's um, Wolfensberger, Social Role Valorization, which some people may have um, heard about and others may not have. And I know now um, you know, what he did was a very long time ago and I'm aware that nowadays some of the stuff that he um, talked about and thought was Good practice then probably isn't as much now. So, you know, the whole thing about um, make, well, just as Alexis was saying again earlier, making people, trying to change people isn't what we want to do with people now. But one of the things that Wolfenberger did talk about, which still I think is, is as important now as it was when I read it God, probably 30 years ago now, something like that was his um, discussions about the wounds that um, uh, that people with learning disability experience through um, what we um, as professionals do to people. Simon, could you just put it on to the next one? <coughs> oh, Simon's gone. I'm here. It's not changed. Yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. So, so, so Wolfensberger talked about um, 18 wounds. I haven't written them all up there. Um, and, but, but if you have a look at these, language plays a part in, in quite a lot of them. And, and what his ideas were that um, it's a bit like, uh, in my mind's eye, I can see somebody sort of being either stabbed or like shot at with a bow and arrow and the more times that that happens uh, 
the more damage it does to you. And in the end, you die. Um, and, and that's very much what his um, thoughts were on this, that you can start with little wounds. And sometimes people might think that um, the way you talk and what you write about somebody are those first wounds for somebody. But as stuff goes on, that leads to other things happening to people. So, for example, you know, you, you might then start segregating people, which we do. Um, so putting them in places together when to live or to do things during the day. Um, and then you might start, because of that, treating people as if they're all the same. Um, and that leads to people not being seen as their own individual person, but, um, but a group of devalued people. Um, and then you might get on to actually thinking, well, because they're not really people, they don't really deserve a life and therefore their lives get wasted. And at the end of it all, um, and we, we know about this, that people um, can actually die from what happens because we're not um, actually treating people as humans. And I very much think that what we write about people and what we say about people um, underpins all of the wounds that, that Wolfram Berg is talking about. And if we don't do something about that, um, you know, people have wasted lives and people die. And that sounds a bit dramatic, I suppose, but I think all of us know of people who have had situations where they have not been seen as people and they have had terrible mm. things happen to them in their lives. Um, so, you know, there is evidence out there that if you don't think about what you write and if you don't think about what you say about people, it can end up with really negative things happening for people. So what, like, next slide, please, Simon. Can you just put down on the chat some of the words then? I know you'd started doing it, but there are, are there other words that you think are used in service land? And words that are used there aren't used anywhere else. They're just used in this weird world, world, world of work um, when we go and work with people with learning disabilities or autistic people. When we go back home again, we use a completely different language. So what are the kind of words that you only find when you're working, when you're working, basically? Anybody want to put up? Abscond, oh, well done, Lisa. Oh, we like abscond. Yeah, challenging behaviour, definitely. <laughs> I mean, we do, I must admit, we do those again on Facebook. We often have a, a, a laugh, which, you know, isn't a laugh really, but about some of the words that we come across as we're going around places. Mm. Um, accessing the, yes, accessing the community, seclusion and restraint. Yeah, yeah. Kieran, can you think of some good words? Um, the one that I find um, annoys people is, is um, service user. Yeah, blimmin' service user, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And ADLs, all those blimmin' acronyms for things that you don't even know. Lego therapy, that's another one. Some of it is just ridiculous, to be quite honest. But there we are. Attention seeking. Yep. Absolutely. So could you put the next slide up, Simon? So these are two of my favourites. And as I say, challenging behaviour was one that I used to when we when we were setting up the um, campaign that I run, I am challenging behaviour. That was because that one just gets on my nerves so much. But when you think about it, so, you know, part of again today is for us to think about what we say and talking and what, what the meaning of that, you know, how that affects people. And challenge behaviour is a word that has no meaning. And if you think about it like that, um, then you'll probably stop using it. And I must admit that is one that I, I don't use at all anymore. You don't have to. Um, because there are other words that we can use to describe what we're trying to say. But by using it, it in its own way, lumps a whole load of people together. It's very unhelpful because it doesn't help you to understand what's going on for somebody. Um, so at the end of the day, 
if somebody um, has challenging behavior, we've got no way of understanding what we need to do to support that person because what is challenging behavior? Um, you know, you need to be thinking about what it is that that person's experiencing, just as Alexis is saying earlier, you know, are they hurting? Are they sad? Are they angry? Are they frustrated? Those are the things that are going to help you um, to help somebody. But the other thing about that word is that it, um, it has very negative connotations. So it makes everybody think that that person's dangerous and that the risk, there's lots of risks and, and people are fearful of people. Um, and again, when you're using service, um, service land language, you end up with service land um, uh, solutions. So it doesn't open up ideas about using the normal things that you or I would do when we were angry, upset, um, you know, all that stuff that's out there that everybody else uses to help themselves. Instead, we look at hospitals and, and stuff like that instead. Okay. Sure. Yeah. Um, Go on, Kieran. Yeah, I, I, I have a slightly different um, <clears throat> problem with the term challenging behaviour. It's basically that, that because it is such a meaningless term and it only means whatever the mm. person using it, yeah. says, it says, says it means. Mm -hmm. As an advocate, how do you actually challenge that having that label? Say that yeah. bit again, sorry. As speaking, speaking as as a self advocate, yeah. as, as a as a senior member of a self advocacy organisation, yeah. How do you even challenge mm. something that yeah is so poorly defined? Yeah, no, exactly. Well, I think it's by asking. So my challenge when people use that, that um, th those words is basically just to say, what does that mean? Because yeah. then they have to think about actually, what have I just said? And, and what am I? Do you know what I mean? And it kind of puts it back into their court, doesn't it? And, and yeah. that's a challenge that seems to work for me anyway, when I'm asking things like, um, you know, when people are using that language, because you aren't going to actually get very much farther um, with your meeting, are you? If, if you're just being told that somebody's got challenging behaviour, you're not actually going to be able to come up with any solutions, really, are you? So, so yeah, and anyone can do that, can't they? They can ask mm. for that. So just quickly, just to say about um, placements, my other one, and I really hate this word because, again, it is so, it, it just doesn't help people and it's used so much with people. But if you think about how it would affect you to be, to feel that you were being told that where somebody was looking for you to live or where you were living at the moment wasn't a permanent solution. So it was a temporary which is what placement is. I mean, placement in the, the dictionary, although it, it doesn't relate to somebody living somewhere, it's about somebody having a work, you know, somewhere to work temporarily, temporary or whatever. It's, it's just made up. But, you know, all those people whose homes are being described as placements, it's just, you know, very, very sad and it doesn't have to happen. Um, so, so they, yes. Yeah. So the, the the implication being that where you are living, however temporary or, or otherwise, mm -hmm. because a lot of placements are extended and extended and extended, mm -hmm. um, is it is the it is often viewed as the professionals workplace to, to, to use it in its proper context yeah. before, before it is having your home. But I think as well it gives people the ability not to not to be looking for somebody as a permanent place but, but also mm. they won't be looking at the same kind of places. When we look for a home we're looking for somewhere to live because we want to stay there and we want to be secure. You know placement just it's yeah. not a good word. Yeah, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm kind of looking to move house in. Mm, but in you're not going to look for a placement, are you? 
over the last couple of years, I'm looking for mm. something that's going to be just as good in 20, 25 yeah, years. exactly. Oh. But I bet you don't go to the estate agent and say, what placements have you got then that I could move in? <laughs> yeah. Or yeah. if you went there, they would look at you as if you were in the wrong place, wouldn't they? Yeah. So could you move on to the next one? So just as, again, I keep saying what Alexis said before, which was brilliant to have. It's amazing to hear it out. You know, somebody who's experienced this as well. But the whole other thing, that's what service land does and that's what language does. And it firmly keeps people in service land and different and us being able to do things to people that we wouldn't do to ourselves and we wouldn't do to our own loved ones. Um, and that's just by using language. Next one. So I just thought of some top tips, because when I do this and I rant on, I usually get asked, well, what would you do about it? And I'm sure we'll have some discussions about that at the end as well. But my top tips are, and this is again what I do sometimes, is look up in the dictionary. There is all... If it's a word that's real, so if it's a real thing, like that all of us would want to do, there's a word for it already, and it's probably in the dictionary. So use that word. And if it's a weirdy word, if it's a service land word, it's not real anyway. So if it was up to me, I just wouldn't bother using it whatsoever, um, to be quite honest. So that's my kind of top tips. And also don't use acronyms or those, you know, like ASD stuff, because why shorten somebody? It's very impolite, really, to be doing things like that when you're talking to somebody or describing somebody. You know, you should give them all of what they're entitled to and your respect. And being respectful isn't using acronyms that nobody knows what they mean in the first place. So that would be my top tips. Um, around what have you got any top tips, Kieran? What would you say? Um, if basically talk, 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 talk in a language that's, that's understandable to everybody, at, at the very least, talk plain English. Yes. Definitely, definitely. Yeah, but we have a language, don't we? We have we have a language that we all understand that everybody can use. And most of these words have just been made up for people with learning disabilities and people who are autis autistic people um, or people with mental health problems. You don't hear them anywhere else. And you know that by talking to people that have nothing to do with the work we do or, or our lives and they don't know what you're talking about so you know stick to the language that we were brought up and taught in school and, and there's always a word that you can use for what you want to describe um, would be my top tip but I'm going to leave it there because it's five past now so I'm going to if we can just open it up now to 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 our because I think the slides will be available we can send them out anyway can't we Hi Alexis, you're here now, Will. So, what do, do people want to, to, to say something or ask a question of any of us? Here is your opportunity. You're on mute at the moment. Can they unmute themselves, Simon? Yeah. Uh, yeah I think so, maybe. <laughs> Sorry, I had a, a, quite a few technical headaches in that. <laughs> So I'm, I'm, way, my it? brain's a bit stretched, but uh, we can try. Um, yeah. You could pick out some. Or put somebody. your hand up. Put your little. Can I? I've done it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thrill. Go for it then. Right. Who was There's that? There's a question in the chat, um, Sam. Can I jump in? Yeah, of course you can. There's a question in the chat about. Um, I work with parents of children who are not meeting the typical milestones for their age. Um, parents are really worried. What would you say to those parents? Um, I think that we need to move away from a medical model, you know, which places the problem in the person. And I think we need to move away from a social model, which places the problem, you know, in, 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 in society. 
And I think we need to look, you know, when children are developing at capabilities, you know, what is it that the baby or the child, you know, wants to do and how can we help them to get there? Because these comparisons, when we're comparing against other people, it's really not helpful. Mm. Um, and in fact, you know, autistic people you know, like myself, um, like some, some people that, that are on this call, in fact, you know, we, ha we have so many different um, abilities um, that, that that sort of comparison, as I say, is, is really unhelpful. So I, I would say to parents, look, what is it that your, your child wants to do? If they're not there yet, how can we help them to get there? And think about what it is that they need to do as well. And they don't need to. Mm. And milestones, they're, they're put in, like you say, by professionals. And most children don't meet them when they're meant to, do we? Or, or have a variation of them. You know, people are all different, aren't they? And they need to do things at different times, really. So is anybody, was there anything we talked about that people don't agree with that, that they like to, to think through? Because you can, because that's, you know, that's what we're all like. Yeah. No? Well, what are people going to, what do people want to go in? Are people going to go away and think or do anything a bit differently? Let's see if we can. Um... Yeah, that's very true, Gillian. So you've just said jargon and terminology is taught in training. That absolutely is. You're right. And the skill is knowing what it means, but choosing to use plain. Yeah. I and I if... think pushing back, I think we need to push yeah. back a bit. Yeah. I think we need to push back. And I think we need to say, you know, I, I think, you know, look, look at where the power is, you know, and, and certainly in terms of, you know, Mm. autism and learning disabilities the power is with you know psychiatrists mm. isn't it and it's with that yeah. medical model and they're obviously invested in keeping things the same mm. so yeah. i think there's something about pushing back and saying actually you know you know we, we don't like this yeah. and this actually isn't helpful and it mm. is in fact harming us yeah and and i think when we start speaking differently mm. about people you know that have different dispositions mm. um people notice yeah, and definitely. it's about then explaining that and explaining why we're doing mm. that. Yeah, and I think, and what I said earlier as well, which which I, you know, hold to myself is is doing it myself. So even at the time, because there's not, it's not always the ability to to challenge things. Sometimes you're in a situation it just doesn't feel right at that minute, but continue to do it yourself. You know, you can start tomorrow morning by saying you know i'm really i'm not going to use those words anymore i'm going to think of other words do you know what i mean and and kind of build your confidence up like that but all of us can do it for ourselves we don't have to wait for somebody else to tell us when i had somebody it made me laugh i was doing some training about this and and a professional said but i was saying about paperwork and how they don't have to write their paperwork like they were do you know what I mean? they can use different words and they said well, no, we can't because it, the bits that are printed there already have these words in them. Do you know what I mean? And so I was kind of saying, well, you've still got the ability to, to change what you write and to say to that person that this word shouldn't be here. Do you know what I mean? I'm, I'm offended by that or whatever. So, um, yeah. so Sam, Alexis, Kieran, then, I mean, in, in a funny way, if you think about this as a social injustice, a lot of that pushback that Alexis has just described is most likely to be effective if if there is some kind of organised social movement, isn't there? Some kind of, I think when, I think when an individual kind of pushes back, just mm -hmm. as an individual, they're often seen as an oddity. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I remember doing when I, we were springing people from Inclusion Glasgow, and uh, you know, just by refusing to play the game in the way you describe people actually sometimes made life harder for you to get people out mm. because the system wants you to play by the game. Yeah. And, and so there's something about changing the rules of the game that we have to do collectively, isn't there? It's not just a personal yeah. responsibility to, to behave differently or think Definitely. differently. Isn't there something bigger that we need to be thinking about? 
there is the social movement that the you described time it's called the, the uh, self, self-advocacy movement yeah and professionals have, have, have said this before and undoubtedly I'll say it again um, professionals commissioners social work uh, managers etc ignore ignore self advocacy at at their mm-hmm. pedal. Um, and I must admit, I was hoping that we might actually discuss uh, the themes brought up in, in, in Alex's video because I made a couple of notes on kind of my own thinking on, on it. What bit's that then, Kieran? Say it. Yeah, we have time. Yeah. <clears throat> Basically, if and I've actually, I've actually put, put this into the chat as well. Oh, so, have you? Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. if, if someone is subjected to the, the level of persecution described by, by Alexa, is that persecution would you to a racial difference or a religious or, or, or alternative alternative religious or political views that 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 would be construed as um, effectively a crime against a crime against, against 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 humanity under international law mm. true and I think the thing is, is that we seem to accept it, don't we? Mm-hmm. You know, uh, just talking about language and talking about the word restraint, for example, restraint, mm-hmm. you know, it should only be used as a last resort, yet we use it to enforce medication. We use it um, uh, to, to limit somebody's to somebody's movement. And, you know, that isn't restraint. That's actually manhandling. You know, that's actually abuse. But because we're saying restraint, it's, it's, it's like a euphemism. For, for what actually is happening, because obviously it is against the law. Yeah. Um, and, 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 and enforcing, enforcing medication, again, is, is, is a form of restraint, mm. wouldn't it? Um, I mean, I mean, the, there are still cases where um, a medical cosh, as it's called, are basically used, isn't it? Where where people are managed by basically being uh, being being turned turned into zombies because of um, by medication. Mm. I suppose so one, so go on. No, no, go for it. Well, I, I suppose it's, I want to come back on your point, Kieran. So, of course, the self advocacy movement is the, the critical point of, of pushing back, but we haven't, fa- we have failed. I mean, like, uh, we, even the word abuse is interesting, isn't it? Because you can use the word abuse in, broadly speaking, the disability social care world and it kind of means exactly what it shouldn't mean it kind of means a cr- the kind of crime we will accept the kind of evil that we just assume will happen in services abuse is treated as a kind of lower class crime and it's a lower class crime because it happens to disabled people or people with mental health problems or what because it happens to to them I mean, it's really weird how the word, there's a whole system for safeguarding and abuse. But if you really ask yourself, why, why do we have a special system for the special people, which basically means lower class policing? <laughs> it means their life will be crappy because we'll stick them in somewhere shit. And then we'll create this kind of completely incompetent system for kind of met. We've got, oh, well, there are low levels of abuse. There are, yeah, we, don't, we don't accept accept that in society 
And uh, I think, I suppose the question that comes out of that for me, Kieran, is I completely agree. This is a civil rights, human rights. I mean, it's about fundamentally the right of people who are different to just exist as equals. Mm. Yet we're not getting much purchase. We're not get, We're not really having that much impact. It doesn't. I mean, I think sometimes like our word might become now suddenly unacceptable. So like mental handicap is no longer acceptable. But we don't actually change the game. We just move certain pieces off the mm. board. Yeah. But we've not actually got people yeah. to think differently about welcoming difference, thinking about, you know, the uniqueness of every human being and the, the gifts that come with disability, with autism, with just different ways of looking at the world and different ways of functioning in the world. All of the giftedness of that is still treated as just a peculiar way to look at things. And I just feel like that that's something we need to be organising around a bit in some way. Mm. Anyway, sorry, that was my Alexis, rant. Alexis right? has got a hand up, but so and so has Kay. So maybe Alexis okay. would like to say something in Kay, and I'll, I'll try and do a better job of facilitating my <laughs> trophy. Uh, Alexis. Yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to say and just 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 emphasise what you said. Um, it made me think about a comment that Susie just put in the chat a little while ago about schools, um, and how hey, I'm a teacher, and how if I so much as touch the child on the shoulder you know, to say sort mm. of well done in a mainstream <clears throat> school, I could be sacked. Mm. Yeah, it's perfectly acceptable to restrain and restrict the movement of special educational needs yeah. children. Um, and, and it's done routinely. Um, in fact, most restraints statistically happen to under sixes. Now, why is that? Mm. Because they're probably smaller and more vulnerable, yeah. I, I, would, you know, I would suggest. Mm. Um, so I just said that was really interesting, just building on what you were saying there, Simon. Mm. Okay, would you like to come in? Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yes. We can, Kay. Hi, yeah, um, well I've only just joined, so I'm not quite sure what the topic <laughs> is. Is it is there different topics, or is it about the way professionals speak to to people with disabilities and treat them as well? Speak to us and speak about us, yes. Yeah, because, well, with my son, his social worker um, doesn't really communicate that well with him. And he's, he's at a spot living um, at the moment and he's not happy. He's, not been, he's been there nearly two years and from the start he's not wanted to be there. He's communicated his... Um, unhappiness and the social worker says um, well it's not all about what you want and all your needs are being met there and you stay in there um, even though his needs are not met there some of them maybe but not all of them and it's like he hasn't got a voice he's invisible and he's not on a section he's, he's on a community treatment order which ends in in about two months um, so basically, it's just going to be out on his ear when it, when it finishes. It, it's, if he wants to leave, he can, but he'll have nowhere else to go. And I just wondered if what well, other people's experiences are with social workers, um, you know, can they just basically just wash their hands of all responsibility? And Miss Sun's on section one, one, one seven, is it, aftercare as well, because he was in hospital. You know, before. So I just really wondered if anybody had had similar experiences of that, and because I know that it's not right, and I have put in a complaint about this social worker, um, saying that it's not about what he wants. Because I would have thought that you know he would have had a say, and it would have been about his happiness. And it's like his social worker doesn't listen to him; he doesn't consider his thoughts and feelings. Um. I don't know yeah. actually, Kay, and I don't know if if people were on here to to think about that. It, does anyone have anything to say? Yeah, um, I've I've heard of a few a few sit a few situations where the social worker 
has got has basically taken taken the person off their books. As soon as as soon as as soon as they're in the in 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 wherever they're going to be put um, in in the supposed living or whatever the um, place is, um, it's like um, trying to get. A, That social worker back is not hmm. well my son my son doesn't want this social work he wants he wants to live on his own he doesn't want to be in the uh, system anymore um <clears throat> but obviously he's got nowhere to go I'm, I'm trying to find him somewhere um and then hopefully I'll apply for direct payments um I don't really know how it all works. Um, and I'm not getting any help from the social worker. In fact, we were supposed to have a meeting with him yesterday and um, less than 24 hours previously, he, um, we found out from someone else that he'd gone off sick. We've had no communication with him for several months. You know, um, we just feel that there's no point in having him really because he, don't, he doesn't really do much anyway. Um, okay, so the, I mean, so you've come into a webinar about it is connected to what you're talking about. It's to talking about yeah. pr the way professionals use yeah. language yeah. and yeah. the way that language can be very unhelpful. I think your issues are connected, but they're also very real world things about what's going on in your life and your yeah. son's life now. I mean, I think there are probably social workers on this call. In fact, Sam, you're a social worker, aren't you? So. Oh, if yeah. you look well, at the ethics of social before. work, <laughs> they, yeah, they're very clear that you should be listening. I think in practice, um, I'm all social workers I meet are, are generally good people, want to do the right thing. But often what happens is actually they just don't know what to do. So when you say things like uh, your son wants a home of their own, often I find social workers struggle to... It, this is part of the problem. It's not just linguistic. It's almost like the system says, here are the placements that you can put people in. <laughs> um, and uh, the system doesn't say, hey, let's help people get homes mm. but it could with also, real housing rights. But it um, also and, helps social workers to continue to keep people like that, doesn't it? Mm. So, you know I mean, it, it can be used effectively to keep people othered. And uh, you know, them in the system. Yeah, yeah, in service land, which is what I was saying about earlier. <coughs> Sarah's got a hand which up as well. Really Sarah really Woolley. Really, Sarah. Hi. Uh, I'm sorry about my washing machine in the background. Um, <laughs> the um, just thinking about Kay's son. Does does he have um, mental capacity? Um, I know it's a, you know that's a wide subject in itself, but it's possible to get a, an advocate or an independent mental capacity advocate just you know an idea you may have gone down well, that route anyway this is the thing he's got an advocate but she can't help him all she does is listen to him she can't put complaints in for him um he can't put complaints in himself i've already put a complaint in last september um about his social work and about the way his conduct um and I got told that I they can't take my complaint any further until my son signs for his medical records. Well, he can't sign for his medical records. So my, my, my complaint is just in limbo. Nobody can look at the complaint. I you know, and I've, I've just replied to them again today and said, you know, why does my son have to sign his medical records? As he's a pointee, why can't I put a complaint in? You know, we just seem to be at Timbrick Falls everywhere. We turn all the time. OK. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um... I did just wonder if, because this is more about language that we're talking about today, isn't it? And I know right. Kay's ever so, because I've spoke to Kay before, haven't I, about yeah, yeah. Uh, his son. Um, but I wonder if, if there's a, a way of some people talking about it afterwards, maybe. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, please. yeah that'd be good. Just it's talking about your son, isn't it? And he's not here, so I'm a bit 
yeah oh he's he's and, fine because he gives oh, me permission to talk to anyone yeah, he's kind. yeah i'm his advocate so he just wants me to we'll try you know, and do what's best in your case, because well okay aren't you so people can get in contact with you there if they've got any ideas can't they what's that sorry Sam, what can... did you say? so you you can be contacted on facebook can't you oh well? yes yeah yeah, so yeah. If people want to message you. So, so has anybody got any other, yeah, anything else they want to say about the presentation at all? Or do you mean any, any thoughts? <laughs> what, what are people going to go away and do? Have a think. Your, well, your internet just, just started to go funny there, Sam. So maybe at an hour and a half, that's oh, the, the, the internet saying, it's time for us to finish. <laughs> And uh, so I want to, can I, could I wrap up a little bit, Sam? I'm just, I think it's coming to the, yes, you've definitely frozen. So your internet has definitely decided to this. So I just want to thank Alexis. This is Alexis's book, Unbroken. And uh, I'd encourage people to buy that book and hear in more detail some of Alexis's experiences um, we will be putting the recording of this and the links online on the Centre for Welfare Reforms webinar page. Um, so we'll be doing that in the next few days. So if you're interested in the topics and want to see Alexis's film again, or hear uh, Sam's um, description and Kieran's thoughts, we'll do that. Um, so I want to thank all of the speakers who were great and the conversation which was not quite as well managed as it should have been which is entirely my fault because of somewhat technical difficulties I was having um, and I suppose yeah that challenge the double challenge really that Sam's saying well what are we going to do about this in our own work but mm -hmm. I think it's also a bigger challenge isn't there how do we make it unacceptable to treat people in this way I think that's one of the questions I'm left with anyway how do we make it not just word by word, you should say this or you should say that, but how do we get people to change their real deeper thinking, that start, the, that thinking that means that we just do not treat each other with respect when we start treating some of us as too different, too other. Um, so a lot to think about, I've got a lot to think about and it's we're, we're exactly on 2.30, which is the end time for the webinar. And so, again, I'm going to close it here and thank you all again. And uh, please stay in touch. Subscribe to the Citizen Network TV show uh, on the YouTube if you'd like to uh, see more things like this. All right. Bye for now, thank everyone. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.